your official host for many years and hosting today's show, Joe Mappa. Great, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Anton. Yeah. So, um, welcome once again to Mount Sinai Hospital, the great Mount Sinai Hospital. <laughs> Uh, it's my pleasure to, to host you. It's, it's such a, a great thing to have this series uh, hosted here quite often. It really uh, makes us taller, and I appreciate it, Anton. Um, I'm not going to, I think at this point of our careers, I'm not going to get into credentials of Tom, of Tom Clausen. <laughs> what I will get into, I think, at this point of our career, some of his legacy, okay? Because as I understand, this is his last sort of public appearance <laughs> Um, before he uh, steps down as uh, Chief Executive Officer of the OHA. Am I right, Tom, on that one? That's great. Yes. So actually, I'm privileged to be the last introducer <laughs> of Tom Clausen before he steps down. But um, let me uh, talk a little bit about Tom, just for a couple of minutes as a form of introduction um, in, in, in the following terms. First of all, I had, the, I had the, also the privilege of introducing Tom about two and a half, three weeks ago at the Shula School of Business to uh, 32 students. And Tom was talking about sustainability of the healthcare system, which is basically a recapitulation of his blogs, if you ever read them, on the OHA, which, by the way, Tom, I use for my board all the time. I copy you all the time. Um, and the actual, his talk, which was a round table talk in front of 32 students, was uh, formed the basis of their exam. We asked a question, and they had a take-home exam. And Tom, just for your information, they all passed. <laughs> But what's interesting, and this goes back to your legacy, is that most of the students, when you mark their papers, uh, talked about this term, this new term in the English language called efficiency dividend. Have you heard that term? Efficiency dividend. And what Tom will tell you, the OHA has used that tremendously as a public relations tool, as also as a, a way of providing evidence why our system is more efficient than the other systems, and therefore, this province saves a lot of money. So Tom has actually changed the English language in economics. If efficiency dividend is the new term that we're all going to use in the future. So that's one of your legacies, Tom, and we're going to change the Webster Dictionary to the Clausen Dictionary, and everything's great. <laughs> the second thing, which is even more impressive and even had, will have longer impact. I don't know how many of you saw the Steve Pagan show last night, TVO? Yeah, a lot of people saw it, and it was, it was a great show. And um, what's interesting about that, Shirley talked about, of course, uh, transparency and related to executive compensation and those horrible things that, that we're all responsible for. But what's interesting about that is they asked Tom a question. They asked Tom a question about leadership. What does the CEO do? Like, what does the CEO do? And Tom talked about direction and execution and about leadership. That was the word, leadership, that he used. And I just want to say, Tom, in front of all these people, and well, what a turnout, like you're like a rock star, I told Tom. Um, leadership is about direction and execution, but it's mostly about courage. Courage to make decisions that you think are right in consultation with other people and to move things forward. And I can tell you, Tom, in my view, and I'm sure the people in this room as well, what you've done as the chief executive of the Ontario Hospital Association has been nothing, nothing less than courageous. Your, you, the way you've handled the, uh, the government, the way you advocated, your proactivity, particularly around the executive compensation, uh, more recently, you have made the industry taller, and um, you have certainly made sure we're a player uh, in the affairs of this province in benefit to Ontarians. And that's your, my view, your legacy. Thank you. You set the role model for how association CEOs should behave uh, on behalf of their constituents. And for me, there's nothing better as a leader in terms of making a difference. And for Dal Tam, Tom, we are grateful, and it's my pleasure to introduce you this morning. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's great. It's great to see. Uh, let me get a microphone going here. Okay. Okay. Is this going to work? Good. No. Yes. Can you hear me at the back? No. no? Yes? I see people saying yes and no at the same time. It can't be. <laughs> well, you laughed. You might, that's right. Nobody ever agrees on anything. I was uh, told by, uh, I don't know if she's in the room, Donna Klein, who used to be my public affairs person when I was at Sunnybrook. Donna always said, 
never speak with a handheld microphone because people are going to think you want to sing. <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm told, but I'm told we don't have the technology for a clip on and still be able to tape this. So uh, anyway, so I'm going to have to use the handheld. Uh, sorry about that. And if Don is here, I promise I won't sing. Um, I, another thing I always try to do is know my audience, so I always look at who's in the audience before I speak, and, and I was standing down here, and Linda Haslam Stroud, the president of ONA, is waving at me, and I'm so glad you waved at me so I know you're in the room, uh, so now I'll be careful about what I say about ONA. Uh, <laughs> but I do have a slide that you, you should, I think it's my last slide, so you better stay till the end, because you're not going to, you may not like it. Um, anyways, uh, honesty is important, and uh, that's what I'm here to do. Now, Anthony Dale was going to stand and sit in the front row with a cattle prod as well, because it is my third last day, and he was afraid of what I really might say. Uh, <laughs> but I still am the CEO of the Ontario Hospital Association, so you have to take my comments in that context. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, talk about uh, ideas related to achieving a high-performing health system, and and that language uh, is the vision of the Ontario Hospital Association. For those who haven't read the strategic plan of the OHA, it's on the website. The vision is achieving a high-performing health system. The, the strategic plan doesn't say much about hospitals at all. And uh, the presentation, of course, is, is therefore much uh, broader. Now, I really want to start by uh, giving you the bad news. And I'm sure you've seen this kind of chart in a variety of forms. But this is the most up-to-date uh, financial projections of this province and um, the, the, the reds are, I guess they should all be in red actually, the reason some are in blue is because they're historical but uh, you can see the first one there that's red, it's 2011-12, the year that we're in and the government is projecting a 16 billion dollar deficit and uh, if you take all these projections of, of deficits out to 2017-18 <coughs> and add them to the number that's in the middle of the chart, which is the current debt of the province, it ends up being about $300 billion in debt for the province, $300 billion. And the provincial auditor, or the auditor general, as he's now called, uh, in his most recent report said, if, even if the government is able to balance by 2017 along this trajectory, even if they are, and he really was questioning whether that was going to be possible given the assumptions they were using, and given the extent to which there's no clear plan on how to reduce expenditures. But even if they are, he said that the, the uh, interest payments at the end, based again, I guess, on assumptions of, of interest rates, would be approximately $16.3 billion a year. So that $16.3 billion a year in interest is almost as much as the government funds hospitals. They fund hospitals 17.2. They fund doctors, so they see a variety of figures depending on what's included, but it's the, 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 the way CIHI defines it, it's uh, over 10 billion, it's about 11 billion. So it's, it's more than all, than all the spending on doctors and it's almost as much as on hospitals. So it's a, it's a pretty serious issue. This, is, uh, this deficit, 16 billion, is about 15% of the government's revenues. And um, uh, we could maybe, maybe later, Linda, we can get into a debate because I just saw when it came out with their own economics statement yesterday. But I'll look at it um, a couple of different ways. But I, but I think that's the most significant one, the fact that the interest payments are going to be so large. And, you know, if you pay, spend the money on interest, you don't get to spend it on programs. And, and that's a serious problem for us. Now, if you look at Ontario compared to the rest of Canada, I have lots of slides, but I tried to be very selective today and only show you. These are the best of my slides, or at least indicative of many slides that I have. Uh, this slide shows you where Ontario sits in terms of the rest of Canada on how much we spend per capita on health care. And um, this, you'll see that we're pretty close to British Columbia. Uh, we're a little bit more expensive than than, uh, than uh, the province of Quebec, but the reason for that is because wage rates are really low in Quebec. Uh, nurses in Quebec make 20% uh, less than they do in Ontario. In fact, the top end of a nurse's, uh, the nursing schedule in Quebec is about the same as the bottom end of the nursing uh, uh, grid in Ontario. And of course it's true for doctors and it's true for CEOs for that matter. Everybody makes less in Quebec, but people are still willing to live there. So you really have to rule out Quebec because CHI doesn't do adjustment for wage rates. 
Uh, and, you, and what you see is that it's really just Ontario and BC. So overall, we're compared to the rest of Canada, Ontario has a pretty efficient healthcare system. Now, this chart, and I think I, I said there's a couple of things I want to mention about the current economic situation. Uh, this chart, which we prepared, um, just looking at uh, what's going on with GDP in this country, is a pretty important chart to look at if you're thinking about the health accord. The health accord came into effect in 2004. Uh, it guaranteed for a number of years 6% increase in funding from the, the federal government. Now, down in the bottom right-hand corner, which you can't really see, but you'll, we'll get you the, these slides will be available to you. If you average the last, since 2004 to 2010, the nominal GDP growth in Canada is 4.3%. So it's 1.7% less than the federal government has been actually providing, been providing to the provinces. And I think most economists suggest that the 4.3 is probably a, a fairly realistic number going out into the future for a number of years is nominal GDP. So that's inflation plus, plus uh, the real GDP. And, and uh, the 1.7% gap, if, if you allow that to occur, like let's say the federal government continued to fund at 6% a year when GDP is only going up at 4.3 uh, and you did that long enough, eventually 100% of the GDP would be devoted to health care. The bigger the gap, the faster you get to 100%. Now, I'm not suggesting 11.5% is the right number, but 100% clearly isn't the right number. And uh, so maybe we could grow for a while in terms of percentage of GDP, but eventually you have to be funding from the provinces and from the federal government uh, into health care at a, at a rate that isn't higher than GDP is going up. Now, I have a bunch of charts that we prepared, and I'm just going to show you two of them that relate to outcomes and comparing Canada to some OECD countries. Because you sort of got to get an understanding of how does Canada really compare in terms of its healthcare system to other countries. And I was going to look at it from the point of view, selectively, I must add, but from the point of view of outcomes, the point of view of processes, and the point of view of cost. So I have a couple of slides on outcomes. Uh, the main reasons people have shortened lives are, are cancer and heart disease. So cancer, uh, this is uh, looking at potential years of life lost and comparing uh, Canada to some of the major OECD countries. And what you'll see is there's really not much difference. This goes back to 1992. It goes out to 2006. I, the reason I've got it in, it's an index as opposed to a number, is because I have a bunch of charts. I have one for each disease. And, uh, and, it, and you do it on an index, then you can look at the slope uh, and, and see whether the slope's different in terms of are we getting better faster for one disease versus another. So that's, that's why I've done it that way. But at the bottom, you'll see that the uh, potential years of life lost per 100,000 population in, in 1992 was 1,032 for Canada. But we're all grouped together, Australia, Sweden, Canada, United Kingdom, France, United States. We're all pretty close together. And what's more interesting, the slope, uh, they all stay close together. So we've all been improving cancer gradually in terms of, and, and this is potential years of life lost before the age of 75. So if people die before the age of 75, die at 65, that counts uh, from cancer, that uh, counts as 10 years. So our outcomes are pretty similar. They're nothing special, nothing spectacular on cancer, just the same as major, other major countries. And then um, I have one here, which is the second most common reason that people lose years of life before 75 is circulatory disease. And on this one, um, there is a bit of a spread. And what you see is the two countries that look really bad are the United States, which as you know spends 17, 18% of their GDP on, uh, on uh, health care. And the United Kingdom doesn't look very, very good as well. And you know, that, they, they have been increasing their spending on, on health care. This only goes to 2006. And there's a lot of other things other than health care, as you know, that cause that determine whether you die of cancer or die of heart disease. But, uh, but anyways, uh, the other countries, actually, if anything, they're getting closer together. And, um, and there's a similar kind of slope. And on this one, the, the um, potential years of life lost per 100,000 population for Canada is 635 in 1992. And it's obviously improved a little bit since then. So on circulatory disease, we're with the best here, but we're, uh, we're nothing special. We're no, we don't stand out as, as being any better. 
Now, that's outcomes. So we can say our outcomes are good. They're good com they're compared to other major OECD countries. Process, as you know, we look terrible. In fact, we have to be close to being the worst of any country in terms of process. Uh, I've just picked two slides here. This, this uh, comes from the work of the Commonwealth Fund, and it was actually published in uh, Health Council of Canada's 2010 report. The first one is um, the same or next day appointment when needed uh, with a doctor. I think Canadians think that that's normal in the rest of the world, that it's hard to get a, an appointment with a doctor. Apparently, it isn't. It's, <laughs> it's normal in Canada, uh, not in the rest of the world. And I've seen these charts for Ontario. They're no different uh, the, in Ontario than the rest of Canada. Uh, we have a very disorganized primary care system in this province and in this country. And, uh, and the primary care system that's out there doesn't really use uh, modern scheduling approaches to, to make sure it's easy for somebody who needs access to care. Uh, I'll just give you a bit of a, uh, an aside. In the last three months, visits to emergency departments in Ontario, compared to the same three months last year, are up over 5%. And this is after we've put all this money into primary care, and there's no, and there's no reason that it would be up more than 5 We haven't had an epidemic of anything, or a pandemic that I'm aware of, that would cause that to happen. But it's, you know, this is for the whole province, and so this is not random number generation. These are huge numbers, and it's up, I think, 5.3%. Uh, and it's consistent in each of the, those three months compared to the earlier years. So what this is saying is uh, able to get an appointment on the same day, next day, when sick or in need of medical attention, only 45% of people in Canada say that's possible. And uh, you know, it ranges up to Switzerland being the best at 93%, New Zealand being at 78%. So we look at specialist care. So you get your GP visit and now try and get a, 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 an appointment with a specialist. And this one has had to wait four or more weeks after being advised to see a specialist, and 43% of Canadians had to wait four or more weeks. We also don't have a very good connection between the primary care system and the specialty care system. And uh, I, you know, you talk to primary care docs and the frustration they faced about trying to get their patients' appointment with specialists. And of course, it's not very automated. Now, Ontario MD is working on trying to make that more automated in terms of the connection, but right now it's not very automated and that would be true uh, across Canada. A number of these other countries are much farther advanced in terms of electronic medical records and doctor's offices, which certainly facilitates uh, the referrals from, from primary care physicians to specialists. In Germany and Switzerland and the, and the United States, uh, the, you have to wait, 9% uh, nine, nine of people have to wait more than um, four weeks. So, okay, so we don't look very good on the process side. So how do we look on the cost side? And I know most people like to use uh, percentage of GDP. Well, I don't, because the problem with percentage of GDP is, you know, is the, the, you have to worry about the denominator too much, right? So it's not so much what you spend, it's how the economy is doing, and it bounces around. Uh, so I like to use total health expenditures per capita in U.S. dollars, US dollars purchasing power parity uh, adjusted. And, and so what we're looking at here is, is in, you know, purchasing power parity, for those of you who don't know what that means, it's sort of how much does a McDonald hamburger cost in each, in each country, and they just sort of try to make sure you're equalizing it on basis. It's probably a bit broader than McDonald's hamburgers, but something like that. So now these numbers, to be fair, they're for slightly different years. Uh, this is OEDC data, uh, and, but it is, at least I'm being honest, and I say which years they're for. But what you'll see is Canada, spends by this measure, and that was this 2010 data, uh, $4,478 per capita in U.S. dollars purchasing power uh, adjusted. The United States is, of course, way off the, the, the mark here at $7,960. It's hard to believe you could spend that much money. Um, and we're down here with countries like uh, the ones that are a little bit higher, Norway, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Denmark's a little bit lower. Australia is a way up there uh, in the middle at 3,445. New Zealand's even higher up in, at 2,983. And remember, I told you they have the same outcomes we have, and they have better processes, and they spend a ton, a lot, a ton less than we do. Um, in Australia, the, the one I know a little bit better, uh, it's probably because they have a much better organized primary care system than we have. And I, I encourage everybody to Google on uh, divisions of primary care, 
Melbourne University, and up will pop a report. It's a nice orange report. They've done an evaluation of the divisions of primary care, which cover all of Australia. They've had them in place. They've been developing them for 20 years. And that report does a statistical evaluation of, of the primary care system five years ago in Australia and concludes that it's had a huge impact on, on the performance of the, of the Australian healthcare system. So I would say they're getting a lot better value for money than we are. I, I really point this out to just suggest to you that there's an awful lot of opportunity to get better value out of the healthcare system that we have. With the money we're spending, we should have much better processes. And uh, well, you know, getting better outcomes is, takes time. Uh, but we could maintain our outcomes, have better processes, and spend less money. Uh, it's quite clear to me when I look at uh, the international data. So I have seven things I'm going to quickly go over here. Uh, some of this, we have a, um, a funding and capacity planning paper that the OHA has put together, and it's on the OHA website. And some of you would have seen the bending the cost curve paper that we issued l almost two years ago now. And uh, those two documents combined give some of the substance for what I'm going to talk about. There's references in, in each of them. But, and there's references at the bottom of all these slides, too, so you know where I got my ideas from. Um, we've spent a lot of time with Don Drummond, who should have a major impact on what goes on in healthcare in Ontario. Uh, we've had uh, three meetings with him and talked to him about the kinds of things that I'm going to mention to you. And we've shown him some of these slides. We've shown him some different slides as well. So the first thing that he's really got excited about, and, and you know this is true in every country, but it comes out of the HBAM data in Ontario, the health-based allocation method, which shows that 1% of the population uses almost 50% of, of hospital and home care costs. I expect it wouldn't be far off if you looked at physician costs, but I've never seen that analysis. So that's really good news because that means that in the city of Toronto, rather than focusing on 2.5 million people, you only have to focus on 25,000 people and figure out how did they get like that? What could you have done to keep them from costing so much? And now they are like that. How can you care for them in a different way? And a lot of that has to do with where they receive their care and who gives them their care. And of course, what care do they receive? The other piece is uh, coming out of the ministry's own work. Uh, we reference it in the Ben and Cost Curve paper about what percentage of the budget is, is spent on, on uh, people with, uh, with chronic illness. And I really don't believe we've organized ourselves very well yet in this province to deal with people with chronic illness. There's been, you know, initiatives to try and deal with diabetes, but, but overall, and, and, and even when I look at the, the performance indicators there, they don't look so hot to me. Uh, in terms of improvement, uh, but this is an area we clearly need to focus on, and there's obviously overlap between those two. Uh, this chart came out of HBAM because people say, well, who are these people that cost so much money? And this is looking at the, the grouper for hospital patients, and what it shows, the line out here that goes to 30%, which says 30% of them are people with circulatory disease, um, interestingly, uh, well, neoplasms, cancer is 16%. Interestingly, injury and poisoning is uh, the third highest. And you may say, injury and poisoning, what's that all about? Well, it turns out a lot of that, when you look at it, are errors that are made in hospitals. So it's, it, we injure the patients. It's not like they came in with injuries or poisoning. I, I don't know if we poisoned them, but we at least injured them. <laughs> and, then, and then this one here, which uh, the next one is respiratory. So those are the, the four key areas. And, um, this is something that um, comes out of CIHI. CIHI loves me because I use all their data all the time. I might be the, the greatest user of CIHI data. Uh, <laughs> anyways, you look at rates of hospitalization for ambulatory care sensitive conditions. So these are the people, this is Canadian data, uh, but it would be similar to in Ontario. Uh, for these, these are people that you would assume maybe could have been cared for on an ambulatory care basis, but somehow they got admitted to hospital or readmitted to hospital, which is uh, maybe the, the bigger issue when you look at who they are. So it tends to be people with congestive heart failure, that's the big spike, and the second one is uh, COPD. And, and that's broken out by age grouping, so you'll see for congestive heart failure, uh, the bulk of it is people over the age of 85 who have congestive heart failure, which I guess would be uh, the key people who have congestive heart failure. But um, we know that with COPD and congestive heart failure, we do a terrible job in terms of the, the transfer of these people from the hospital into the community. 
Uh, here's something I've been talking to the ministry about uh, recently. Why isn't it required? Oh, here's a way to look at it. As a hospital CEO, one of the things that always may, that I always thought about that was probably the most important thing you had to worry about in a hospital was who was the most responsible physician, right? It was that clear. And that's particularly a, a challenge in a teaching hospital where you've got all these specialties and you know, residents. Like, who's really the responsible physician? And so there's a lot of policies about transfer of responsibility from one physician to another. But when a patient finishes their acute episode, there's no transfer of responsibility. We just drop them out the door, right? There's no, there's no responsibility for the physician who's discharging the patient to make sure that that patient has an appointment with a doctor. So they go home, and then they try to get an appointment with a doctor, and you already saw that graph. So I think that would be a good place to start, to say you can't discharge somebody until you're clear that they've got a timely appointment, that that appointment has been set up, and also that you transfer the information to the receiving doctor. It works the other way, too. Patient comes into a merge. Wouldn't it be really great for the merge to be able to get in contact with the family physician that knows the most about that patient and be able to access their records. Now that is happening in Barrie. We've got a great situation in Barrie. They've got one family health team for almost all the docs and they've got one big hospital. And, and Ontario MD is working on being able to transfer the information both ways. So the emergency will be able to get the information out of the doctor's uh, electronic medical records and, and the, uh, the, electron the doctors in their offices will be able to get the information quickly from the hospital. But that's, I mean, that's the way it should be everywhere, shouldn't it? But I, I think one of the main reasons these people get readmitted and admitted so often is, is the handoff is terrible. And uh, so they just get readmitted. They get into trouble. I, I, I just got to tell you the story. M my dad died about two, three years ago. Well, when I first joined the OHA, he was still alive, so I used to talk about him. But he died. But he died at the age of 93, so, you know, it's, it was a good age. And my mother, who's still alive, she's 91, um, she controlled everything in his life, uh, which I gather is quite normal. Uh, <laughs> so her view was the drugs that he went into the hospital with, you know, when you go into hospital, he was in and out of many hospitals. He gave me a good sense of how hospitals work in Toronto. Uh, that when he was discharged, he was always given different drugs, right, than the ones he went in with. But my mother was of the opinion that if some drugs are good for you, more drugs are even better. So, <laughs> so when he would be discharged, she always thought it was best to give him both sets of drugs. <laughs> I, I, until he got to see his family doctor, and I pointed out the challenges of getting to see your family doctor after you discharge. So anyways, uh, he died of congestive heart failure, by the way, so maybe that's uh, uh, important here. Uh, I didn't know where to put this slide in, but I thought it was important, so I threw it in here. And it's per capita pharmaceutical spending by country. I just want you to know, we are almost the highest spending country on pharmaceuticals. We are way up here. This is Canada. The well, United States, as you'd imagine, spends more. But we are at 692. So for those people who work drug companies, if you don't think we're using enough drugs in Canada, um, sorry, it looks like we are. OECD average is way down here. Uh, New Zealand, <laughs> one of the the country that gets the same outcomes as that we do and spends a lot less money and, and has better processes, they only spend this small amount on drugs. We've got to find out what's going on in New Zealand. I, I visited there. It's a very nice place. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's just the trees or the ocean or something. I don't know. But Australia is down here, or Australia is down here as well, near the OECD average. So I think that's clearly something to look at. Why are we spending so much in drugs and not getting uh, any better outcomes than these other OECD countries? OK, so that's uh, just a ga grab bag. Um, so now make targeted evidence-based investments in key areas through shifting funding. The OHA's position, and it's in our strategic plan, is we've got to target a 5.5% increase in per capita expenditures in the community. We've got to get people, if you want to save money, hospitals spend a lot of money. And um, I will ask you my favorite question now, which is, how many of you would like to spend a night in a hospital bed? <laughs> so our goal should be to keep people out of hospitals, to make it less likely for them to be admitted. If they are admitted, get them out fast and try and keep them from being readmitted. And the only way we're going to do that is to invest in the community. And so the, uh, the, we've got to do it in an evidence-based way, though. 
And um, you know, so community-based services generally, particularly for the frail elderly, obviously, we have this huge ALC problem still, I'll come back to that in a moment, and also uh, community mental health, to try and keep up people who with uh, mental illness and addictions coming, uh, bouncing in and out of the emergency department, try to keep them stabilized in the community. But the, uh, it's got to be evidence-based, so we've got to find things that work. Uh, the third thing is integrating physicians into the system. Um, Shalom Globerman was the first person that said uh, to me, the physicians are outside the healthcare system. I remember when he first said it, that sounds very odd, but it is so true. Physicians are outside the healthcare system. It sounds, it, it just isn't uh, appropriate. We try to run our hospitals and our home care and our long-term care homes over here, but the doctors are over there. Whether it be primary care, and we look at our LINs, they have no responsibility for doctors, whether it be specialists or primary care physicians, except community health centers, which is, you know, there's only like 110 doctors working in community health centers, F for FTEs. So it's not a lot of doctors. And, and, um, uh, and public health, they have no responsibility for that. So things that are more physician-oriented, they're sort of outside the rest of the system. So we've got to integrate physicians into the structural reform. We've got to have primary care physicians, specialists, and public health integrated regionally within the province, funded regionally, accountable regionally, performance indicators posted regionally, Primary care in this province is totally opaque. There are no performance indicators on, on primary care posted anywhere. We have lots of indicators on hospitals, and we have indicators on long-term care homes, nothing on primary care. And the only areas we have specialist, specialist indicators are the ones that relate to hospitals. We have no idea what, how specialists are performing in the community. So integrating the doctors into the rest of the system. Uh, I estimate, nobody can give me the answer, the true answer, that there are between two and 3,000 primary care entities in this province. We hear about the 200 family health teams, but they only serve about three and a half million people. There are, there are a lot of doctors working in ones and twos, particularly in this city. And uh, so trying to get the doctors more organized in primary care and specialty care, in specialty care, trying to get them thinking regionally. I actually, the, o, the OHS position is that we shouldn't have hospital medical advisory committees, we should have regional medical advisory committees that look at primary care, look at specialty care across a piece of geography and have the doctors take on the responsibility for serving populations, not just the patients who are in front of them. So that's what this is all about. Everybody needs to be rostered. On the primary care side, I'm not suggesting that the divisions of primary care in Australia is perfect, but it's such a stretch from where we are right now. I, I don't have time to give you the details, but you should read about it. Um, we spend a lot of money on doctors in this province. This, this, is, this, graph comes, or this chart comes out of bending the cost curve. Uh, it's been updated to the most recent CIHI data. And what it says is we spend, uh, by this is CIHI data, $897 per capita on doctors. The rest of Canada spends $712. Now, the OMA will point out that, and I put it in the fine print, that in Ontario it includes the private labs, the commercial labs, and it does, I think, in BC. It may not in other provinces. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. But if you do the math here, the, the, the 897 minus 712, you get 185. You multiply it by the 13 million people, and it suggests uh, we're spending at a rate that's equivalent to $2.5 billion more than is spent in the other provinces on physicians. So if you, take, if you back out the private labs, 663 million, you'd still be at about $1.9 billion. Uh, the question is, and the Auditor General a asked it in his most recent report, where's the accountability? What, what are we getting for this uh, spending? Because a lot of this spending has occurred in the last few years. It's occurred in the last eight years, uh, particularly, but maybe in the last six, primarily. Uh, and given that we don't have the performance indicators and the accountability to integrate the doctors into the rest of the system, I would suggest uh, we're not sure what the answer to that question is in terms of whether we're getting value for that additional investment. Now, ISIS is doing a report on physician compensation by specialty. It's going to be posted on their website either this week or next week. So you'll be able to track what's happened with physician compensation by specialty. Medians, quartiles, deciles, all the statisticians are going to love it. 
Number four, initiate prov provincial level health care capacity planning. This is something OHA has been asking for long before I became the CEO, and I keep asking for it, but we're getting no traction with the government on it. We, our view is that not since the time of the restructuring commission, which takes us back to 1998, have we actually looked at what is the right mix of capacities of service in this province. You know, how many hospital beds should we have? How many long-term care places, assisted living spaces, home care hours, et cetera, et cetera? We don't know. And so each Lynn is off doing their own thing. I think we're pretty clear as an association that we don't provide enough home care and that there really isn't an assisted living policy that enables people to, to be in assisted living because they can't afford it. Um, Ben in the cost curve paper points out that you know, we still have 4,000 people as alternative level of care patients in hospitals. It's gone down from a peak of about 4,800, but uh, for every 10% shift, you'd save about $35 million serving people in the community. Uh, and uh, every 10% shift in palliative care from acute care to home care would save about $9 million. So we've got some references in there for that. I want to show you this rather busy graph, but this takes you back all the way to November uh, 2007. And these green bars are how many people were alternative level of care. And uh, so it's between four and 5,000. It actually peaked, I'm wrong, it was over, got over 5,000. This blue bar, the OHA, this is OHA data. We've stopped collecting it because the ministry through Cancer Care Ontario is now collecting it and they have a really good system. But their system shows, they're, they're, they just started in October, that it's about 4,100 people and it's about 15% of hospital beds are ALC. Uh, the, one of the differences here, and it's in the footnote, they don't include 37 small hospitals and 220 ALC patients. They collect mainly from the bigger hospitals. But so they've got basically the same data we've been showing. So it's 15%, 4,000, and, and more importantly, 4,000 people. And you know, they're all frail elderly, or most of them. Some people have serious mental illness. There's nowhere for them to go. Half of these ALC patients have been in more than 40 days. So. It's half of the days, I shouldn't say half of the patients, half of the days are attributable to people who have been in more than 40 days. Some of them have been in a couple of years. Not a very good way to use hospitals and not a very good place for them to be. We don't do them any good at all. Uh, number five, accelerate the excellent care for all strategy with a focus on improving and, and, and uh, basing decisions on solid evidence. And um, you know, I think the government's thinking of going into primary care next beyond hospitals. We think it's, it's a good piece of legislation the idea of developing quality improvement plans, holding people accountable for achieving performance targets, and in the case of executives of hospitals, actually having to pay for performance. Um, examples that we have in the bending and the cost curve paper, 10% reduction of expenditures on wound care across all settings. If every, we could get doctors and nurses to follow evidence-based practice for wound care, we'd save $100 million a year. That's what the literature shows, because it's done differently everywhere. Every 10% reduction in adverse events in hospitals could save 12.5 million. Having seen that other chart about all the people that we seem to be injuring in hospitals, I have a feeling that that number is quite low in, in terms of what the reality is. But the data source we had at the time, that's what it said. I just want to show you a couple of examples here. The one that's getting the most attention is hips and knee replacements, as you probably know. It makes up three, this is an amazing number, 3.6% of all acute care inpatient activity based on cost in, in Ontario is hip and knee replacements. That's huge for one thing. And we spend $414 million on them a year. And there was a 2005 study that said that if you're going to have rehabilitation, you might as well just go home because going to a rehab bed uh, is of no value. You get the same outcomes, it just costs more. Um, despite those 2005 recommendations, which by the way was seven years ago, um, we have in some lens as many as 50% uh, of people going into rehab beds after the hip and knee replacement. So you sort of wonder, like if we knew this seven years ago, why didn't we change it? Uh, I would think this would be an obvious one for us to change right now. The estimate of savings is about $17.5 million. Uh, you know, there's no, nothing that's gonna save 16 billion, but they all add up. Um, I wanted to show you this one. I, I always think we could do a lot better in stroke, and I think we have done a lot better on stroke with the stroke network, but this is just an overwhelming chart and I, I think I, I got this out from the Ontario Stroke Evaluation Report, so it's their report with the help of ISIS. This is the percentage of eligible adult stroke patients who received an acute thrombolytic therapy. So this says among, among ischemic uh, stroke patients who arrived in ED within 2.5 hours of symptom, symptom onset, 
and do not have contraindications for TPA. So what it tells you, if you're in the Northwest, only 11% of the people who should have got it, got it. Only 11%. And the highest is Mississauga Halt, or sorry, Toronto Central at 42. It certainly suggests there's something wrong with our delivery system. And so people are getting paralyzed unnecessarily. And of course, there's other charts that show people who would benefit from getting stroke rehab once they're paralyzed aren't getting it because those beds are filled up with people who are getting their hip and knee re uh, rehab. I have lots of charts, but I don't have time. <laughs> I don't have time to show you all my charts. <laughs> I guess the bottom line is the work is not yet fully done. <laughs> so, uh, number six, implementing patient-based payment systems. We're big believers in this. We think we can drive evidence through the system by paying only for evidence-based care and, and funding on the basis of the mix of patients and the way you're serving them. I said it's where you serve people, how you serve them, and who serves them, and there should be evidence around that for a lot of things we do, and we, and we should build that into the funding system. Uh, we also believe strongly that Ontario needs a, a, a provincial payment commission. We think that there should be a commission created that negotiates with the doctors outside of government. Uh, I think it's very difficult for government to negotiate with the doctors. You'll see that in all the editorials. They're all saying, uh, we think the doctors are going to win, right? You've got to have a payment commission separate from politics to be able to negotiate with the doctors. That same payment commission should be negotiation, uh, should be setting rates for hospital funding, they should be setting rates for long-term care homes, they should be resetting rates for home care. All aligned. That's what we need in this province. If we want, and to drive patient-based payment system through a, a, an organization that has the analytical capacity to be able to do it properly. And then this is my final one. Oh, oh here's where we're getting into trouble. Um, so the first one is the Health Labor Disputes Arbitration Act. Um, we, we have a number of suggestions for changes to that. Now, I do not, I, I worked in British Columbia where healthcare workers have the right to strike. I do not think that's helpful. So if you don't give people the right to strike, you have to have arbitration. And so we have arbitration, but the arbitrators are governed by a piece of legislation as to what they can and cannot do. So we have a number of suggestions on how to tweak that legislation. I won't get into all the details, uh, but it's in the, uh, the paper, the funding capacity planning paper, to make it a more level playing field around arbitration when, it, when it, uh, we get to arbitration. Make it more linked to the economy uh, and what's, what's, uh, what's feasible in terms of pay increases. Uh, the second uh, is maybe even more interesting. It's Paslerda. When Paslerda was passed uh, back, uh, when the Conservatives were in power, it was done to actually enable the movement of services out of hospitals into the community. When Lycia was passed to create the LINs, the combination of the two have basically acted to make it almost impossible to move things out of hospitals into the community, particularly moving things to non-unionized organizations, because their fear is the way that piece of legislation works is unionization by stealth. It's as clear as that. So we've given Don Drummond and the government a number of changes that should be made to Paslerda and the Labor Relations Act to make it possible to be able to move things out into the community. You know, we're going to really talk a good game, move things out to the community, give the community more money, but if none of the community agencies wants to take it because they're afraid, here's why they're afraid of unionization. They're only paid so much. Like, I'm not opposed to unionization. I love unions. <laughs> <laughs> but. These agencies are only get so much money, and their concern is if they become unionized and they have to pay their staff more, it could actually put them out of business. They could go broke. That's the concern. So they say, oh, no, we don't want to deal with it. Um, so this is a big problem, and it's something the government, if the government's serious about restructuring the system and doing things in the community rather than hospitals, they're going to have to make changes to Paslerda. The final thing is, uh, amending the Work, the work uh, Safety and Insurance Act, we think hospitals should, uh, if they want to, self-insure for uh, workplace insurance. We've done the analysis. There's a huge overhead with the Workers' Compensation Board, and uh, the school boards did this a number of years ago, and we, we calculate that uh, we could probably save $100 million a year. We'd have to buy our way out because, you know, they have an unfunded liability, but that could be paid back over about four years. 
and, and then hospitals would basically save about $100 million a year. And the school board experience actually shows that once the school boards became self-insured, they became safer places to work. So besides just the math of not having the overhead of the WSIB, we'll have safer places to work. We need a regulatory change. We can't, you know, WSIB has told me you want to buy your way out. Well, fine, give us the money. But, uh, uh, but that's not going to happen unless the government changes the regulations. So I think that's the last slide I wanted to show. And the reason I put this here is I was really, you know, and Anton said that the, my topic was in conclusion. It sounded like I, you know, only had a couple of months to live. <laughs> <laughs> so I could look at it from that perspective. And also from the perspective of, you know, these are all OHA positions. And the OHA is going to continue even after I'm gone. So to be continued, these are all good ideas. I'm sure you have many others, but I'll stop talking and uh, I'll take any questions. Thanks. As you know, Tom, I'll do anything to uh, get a crowd. And apparently it worked. <laughs> Uh, but in the typical Tom, that he leaves us a roadmap, leaves us objectives, uh, crystal clear. He'll probably be following us closely. And now is your opportunity, if you miss something, to ask some questions other than, what are you doing next, Tom? We'll just eliminate that one. Who's got the first question? I'm over here by the unions here, Tom, but <laughs> she's not putting up her hand. Don't you want to challenge Tom a little on this arbitration issue? Sure. Come on. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Uh, Hi. So, uh, <laughs> amendments to uh, the Hospital Labor Disputes Arbitration Act. Uh, it already provides uh, guidance to the arbitrators that uh, they have to take into consideration the ability to pay. Uh, so, so that's the employers uh, give uh, in the system, and of course, uh, we, as the nurses, don't have the right to strike. So, what are you suggesting needs to be tweaked? Well, there's a whole series of things, but uh, I mean, one of them might be, as you know, uh, there was an own arbitration where the arbitrator actually put something in the in the agreement that neither party asked for. So, Are you still <laughs> <laughs> and it, and you know, arbitrators shouldn't be able to do things like that. Um, there, I think that one possibility might be to try and link it more to the private sector because the private sector is what determines the economy uh, and so and arbitrators tend to do their their um, replication to the public sector um, and what happens is private sector and public sector pay increases are totally out of sync you'll see private sector go up when the public sector isn't and you'll see public sector going up when the private sector isn't so I mean, we just have a number it's all tweaking seriously Linda. <laughs> nothing overly serious but we do think that uh, there are some changes that should be made to that act I think, uh, more importantly, I, I am concerned about uh, uh, our ability with the labor legislation generally to be able to move things out into the community. And I, I've, I've got lots of examples uh, that have been given to me by uh, hospitals and, and home care agencies and uh, the CCACs. Tom, I'll just ask Reza Deber to prepare. She's a classmate of yours. You know. Yeah, Reza and I went to high school together. Uh, is she here? Oh. So, yes, yeah, she's here. I'm going to ask her to tell well, stories. Yeah, yeah. Then. And for those of you who hadn't heard me say this, uh, uh, Reza was a valedictorian and I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, she went to MIT and I went to U of T. So <laughs> I, I always get nervous when you're going to have her ask me a question. Well, she's she's <laughs> going to get ready. <laughs> Tom, when you were leaving uh, UHN, uh, so I'm taking you back a few years, I'd ask you a question about the LINs. Were they going to work? And your view at the time was, no, but it's not a poor idea. It just needs a few iterations. And when I asked you if there was any other example in Canada, you had mentioned Edmonton. So given, given that, that your talk today focused a lot about shifting to community, um, I wonder what you, any f looking forward, what you'd like to comment on. Okay, so um, probably what I meant by Edmonton was uh, at that time I think there was a general belief. I'm going to just flip back to this slide about where we, uh, how provinces spend money. Um, there was a, a belief that Edmonton probably had the best health region in Canada, 
when Sheila Weatherall was running it. And as you know, they're, politically, they made a decision in Alberta to do away with all the health regions, and now they have one agency for the whole province. Uh, just have a look at this graph to see how, how, how Alberta is doing. It is unbelievably bad. Unbelievably bad. They are spending, I do not know how they spend so much money. They, they are spending about 25% more per capita than uh, uh, we do in Ontario. In fact, on hospitals, they spend 50% more per capita on hospitals. And they have a younger population. Uh, they only have 10.5% over the age of 65. Um, so they've, they've lost control. I, I do believe and I, that we need regionalization, and that's really the point I was making, and that's why we were supportive of the LINs. We wish the government had have gone before the election and done the evaluation of the LINs. Uh, we think there's lots of things that could be improved, but we are supportive of, of regionalization, and uh, we got to get on with, with that kind of change. I, and, I, and I do think there's... See, I've come to believe that there's real value in local boards, of hospitals. That may surprise you that I said I've come to believe it, but remember I worked without hospital boards in, in BC for a while. We are running our hospitals at 20% less cost per capita than they do in the rest of the country and we have the best wait times for surgery. Um, and our outcomes are pretty similar to the rest of the country. So it, it seems that that local attention of leadership and voluntary governance is paying off. Um, but, but you can't have hospitals all operating off on their own. So you do need the regional framework at the same time. I also think, you know, if we could organize the primary care docs into clumps, into groups within each LIN, because you don't want the LINs having to fund, you know, uh, 2,000 primary care groups and, and 2,500 other agencies. That, that's impossible. So there has to be some consolidation. But I think they consolidated too much in Alberta, and I think they've lost control of their system. Um, and you know, maybe they just had too much money as well. Okay, Ray, I'm going to give you the mic. I see you. Tom, I noticed you were very careful not to indicate that you were Mr. Vaughn. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was the most popular person in the high school. Just, <laughs> just to. Now I really wish you hadn't given her the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> No, I really enjoyed your talk, and I found a lot of the, the stuff you said to be excellent, and I love the emphasis on the distribution of health expenditures, because we're actually also doing some work on it and finding the same things. But what I'm wondering is, how does that fit in to the funding models you're proposing? Because you talked a lot about going to patient-based work, but there's also heavy fixed costs, and there's also the issues of appropriateness, if you sort of look at the overuse, underuse, misuse, quality things. So I'm wondering if you're concerned that moving more towards patient-based funding is going to encourage more overuse, less appropriate care, uh, and how you tweak it so that you incent to do appropriate care rather than just more care. Okay, so I'm glad you asked that question. That's, that's uh, one I can answer. Uh, <laughs> the HBAM, health-based allocation method, is about, is about rates. So how much do you pay for a hip replacement or a knee replacement? But it's also about volumes. How many do you do? And remember, the idea was to look at the socio-demographics of the population and try to arrive at what's a right volume, not just a right rate. And in fact, if you look at the literature, you'll find that there's a lot more savings to be made on the volume side than there is on the rate side, because what's happened over time, hospitals have all tried to become more efficient, and they've moved, they've got closer together in terms of the way they do things. Uh, we have wide variation in volumes in this province. And now, you know, some studies will say, well, maybe they're underserviced in some areas. Well, maybe, but maybe they're also overserviced in a number of other areas. And, and I think that's something that really needs to be tackled as part of patient-based funding. At, right up front is trying to manage down the volumes in some parts of this province. Um, I, I know you're retiring from the OHA, but we all know you'll be back one way or the other. So could I just remind you that there is Accenture and Baxter and NRC Picker Canada and Sanofi and Deloitte who are sponsors of today's event and I'm sure they'd love to have your services. <laughs> <laughs> that said, we're giving a, a check to Wellspring, which is a cancer support organization, 
and uh, they are fortunate enough to have Tom on their board. Well, I was. I'm not. Are you gone? Yeah, I'm never. But we know where your heart is, so that's where the donation is going. We appreciate you coming today. The next Breakfast with the Chiefs is going to be on March 21st. It will be Matt Anderson together with Danielle Martin. And those of you who don't know Danielle, you will not forget her once you're here. She's a primary care physician. And I su suggest you set that date aside. Thank you, Tom. And thank you for coming to Breakfast with the Chiefs.